Good morning and uh, welcome to our webinar today on Business 401k Plans, Keys to Successful Operation and Management of Your Company's Retirement Plan. Uh, my name is Daniel Rodriguez and I'm the CEO of CRI PPA Services. And with me today is Joy Hodgson. She's our Chief Operations Officer. And we will be uh, talking about some these keys to successfully operating your, your retirement plan, and, and we'll be covering those over the next hour. Um, first of all, I uh, want to say thank you very much to um, everyone that is uh, in attendance today uh, for taking time out of your day. Uh, CRI TPA Services is a subsidiary portfolio company of Car Rigs and Ingram, and um, we We've been doing TPA work for, for quite a long time and I was out of the individual offices in the firm. But just last year, we actually um, were, were spun out into a separate entity. And so we've, we've just completed about 15 months in operation as a, our own standalone portfolio company. Um, just as uh, some kind of housekeeping items, uh, you should have the slides and the uh, PDF, or the PDF available to you in the handout section of the Dodo webinar uh, presentation. Um, and uh, we will, as we go throughout this presentation, we're going to be referencing 401k plans primarily because that is going to be the most common to most of you. But we have a wide variety of individuals on the call. We have financial advisors, CPAs, HR people, payroll, uh, business owners. So we have a lot of different um, groups on here and you may have a 403B plan or a governmental 457 plan. And that's okay uh, that you do. There are slight differences between the two, but the general principles will hold regardless of whether it's a 403B plan or a 401k plan, but there may be some slight differences to your specific plan. So again, thank you for, for joining with us today. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, again, my name is, is Daniel Rodriguez, and I'm the CEO of uh, CRI PBA Services. I graduated uh, from Florida State University here in Tallahassee, Florida, which is where I'm, I'm located. I got my uh, bachelor's in accounting and finance and, and my master's with, in accounting with a special, specialization in taxation. I enjoy watching sports of all kinds, um, but uh, the baseball World Series is happening right now. I'm, I'm a fan of the Seattle Mariners, um, which uh, they're, they're not very good, but I enjoy watching any, any sports, whoever's on. Uh, last summer, I was able to travel for the first time west of Pensacola, Florida. I'd never done that before in my life, but did it for the first time last summer. And um, lastly, uh, my wife and I have been married for 12 years. We have four kids, ages uh, one and a half to 11, and we have a three-year-old dog named Pepper. And then with me today is, is Joy Hodgson. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Daniel said, we're, we're very excited to see so many people on the webinar today and just appreciate you taking time. Um, the folks who help us with these presentations, I think, felt like uh, we needed to show a different side of ourselves that we do have a life outside of maybe spreadsheets and tax forms. So uh, we appreciate them putting together uh, these little breakouts. Um, I personally went to Abilene Christian University which is in uh, Abilene, Texas, not Abilene, Kansas. So a lot of people um, are familiar with that here in my part of the country. But uh, as Daniel said, we've got folks from all over the, the country here. Um, so the one, one fact a lot of people may not know about me is that I uh, am a, was a basketball player. I played my entire life and uh, in high school, that culminated in being part of a state championship basketball team here in Texas. Um, I didn't realize we were going to put the year out there, so that really does date me a little bit. Um, I do love to travel and have been a lot of places, but uh, was fortunate last year to be able to travel to Germany and have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed spending the time there. I, I do think it's my favorite destination I've ever been to, and hopefully when we get to 
I get back to traveling, I can go back. And then I also uh, enjoy cooking in my spare time. I, I do cook most meals every night. So that's a, that's a little bit about me. Um, with that, we're going to jump on into the presentation. Um, our key topics, um, as Daniel said, we're really here to describe to use some best practices if you're someone who's responsible for your company's 401k plan or maybe it's a different type of plan some of the key topics will be applicable no matter the plan type uh, but there are some major areas where if you're if you're the responsible party you need to to know quite a bit about what's going on with the plan so that that's the the ultimate goal here we're going to cover where do i start if you're just now starting what are the primary things you need to be looking for we're going to cover eligibility enrollment and, and employee notices so that you can explain all of this to the employees we're going to cover payroll and eligible compensation topics and we're going to cover then participant transactions so that's the broad um, scope of our presentation today so where do I start? <clears throat> a lot of times we find that an individual somehow becomes responsible for the company's retirement plan. Um, and maybe they don't have a lot of background, don't know where to start, what they should be looking for. And so <clears throat> if, if you find yourself in that boat or if you're servicing retirement plans, either as a um, an accountant, you help your client with their retirement plan, you do calculations for them. Anyone involved with the retirement plan should always have a copy of the written plan document. So if you don't know where that document is, have never seen of it, never heard of it, that is the very first thing you do. Find a copy of the document. Every plan, whether it be a profit sharing, money purchase, simple IRA, 403B, a SEP, all these retirement plans that are sponsored by businesses have a written document. And so every plan needs to have a copy of it. Um, it it's sometimes called an adoption agreement or it's sometimes called a plan and trust. So if you, if you are asking your service providers, um, you say, I, I want the document or I need the adoption agreement, one of those terms will usually um, get it for you. Um, the key thing to note is that it must be signed by the employer to be valid. Um, it also needs to be dated. The signature needs to be dated. If, if you don't have a signed copy, a signed dated copy, then the service, the IRS, the DOL will consider it a paperweight. They, they will tell you it's not a valid plan unless it's got a signed document. Um, it is also not a static document. It, it does have to be updated. Generally, these are updated on a six year cycle. Um, and we are currently in the front section of a document restatement period. So sometime between now and the next 12 to 18 months, you will likely be contacted by your document provider to tell you that that document has to be updated and restated for all the legislation that has passed in the last six years so be aware of that um, and the third thing is you you have to follow the document terms so some of the document language will be regulatory meaning it's the tax law it's the trust law that you have to follow but some of it will be discretionary selections that each business will have chosen eligibility periods contribution types those will all be spelled out in the document. And if you don't follow what your document says, you have an operational violation. And so it's not, it's not important that you have it. It's important that you have it and you follow it. So for example, if, if you say, well, we don't cover part-time people in our retirement plan. We never have. We, we just don't offer the benefit. Well, if your document doesn't specifically say part-time people are excluded, you may have a problem there. So you want to have your document, but you also want to read it and make sure you are operationally following it. Every plan is either 
a calendar year or what we call fiscal year end. It's generally 12 months. So it's really important that you know, does my plan operate on a calendar year or some other off period? Okay, the next thing we need to know about is every plan has a named fiduciary. And a fiduciary is the individual or the entity responsible for ensuring the assets in the plan are protected and used exclusively for the employees only. So there's always at least one fiduciary, but there's possibly additional. So the employer who's sponsoring the plan is always a fiduciary. And by extension, the owners and generally officers of the employer are, are fiduciaries. The plan administrator, is also named in the document. That's the person who's supposed to be responsible for ensuring the plan operates correctly. That's not the same thing as a third party administrator. The plan administrator is the responsible party. Now they may hire out a third party administrator to help them, but that's not the same thing. You could also have a trustee who's a fiduciary and a Occasionally, there will be a specific entity, a financial advisory firm, for example, who's the designated investment manager of the assets. So those are possible fiduciaries. Okay, the other thing you need to be sure you know, and this would be in your document, is specifically which company is the plan covering? Sometimes we have clients who have, for tax purposes, they organize their business. They might have one company that has salaried employees and another company that has hourly employees. Or you might have a warehouse that has employees and a trucking company separate that has employees. Well, you need to be sure your document says which company, which employer is covered by the plan. Um, if there are multiple businesses in your organizational structure, generally you'll have a separate, what we call a participation agreement or a joinder agreement. So you'll have the primary sponsor and then participating sponsors. So you want to look for that if you've got multiple entities. Uh, a retirement plan is strictly for the benefit of W-2 employees or owner owners. Okay, so we are not going to cover 1099 independent contractors in general. And again, some plan types, for example, governmental entities, sometimes they have some exceptions, but for the most part, corporations, sole proprietors, you know, for-profit type entities are only going to cover W-2 employees and owner, owner employees. If you used leased employees through a payroll company or a PEO, an employee organization, you want to especially watch out for that. You want to make sure that they're not being covered under both plans or that nobody's covering them. So be aware if you have that in your organization that they need special care. Okay. The other thing you want to be aware of is if you have what we call related businesses or affiliated groups. So this, this happens in a couple of different ways. If you have an owner of your company who also has ownership in a different company, maybe completely separate and apart, or it may be related, um, then you may need to uh, seek some special consulting on that to make sure you're in compliance. The IRS has a very specific set of parameters and restrictions for related businesses. Um, I have one slide here. I, I could actually create 50 slides on this topic because it is a very complicated piece of tax, tax and regulatory governance that we have to follow here. But in terms of an example, let's say we've got a family. No, let, let me go back. Let's say we've got an ophthalmologist who has a ophthalmology practice. 
and he's the, the doctor is the 100% owner of that practice. He has 10 employees. And he also has a small interest in a LASIK surgery center in which he uh, sends his patients and then he provides surgery services over at this LASIK center. He's an owner, but he's not really involved. It's got its own employees. Um, in some instances, that is a related group and the retirement benefits have to be considered for both groups. It's typically involved um, professional service groups, healthcare, CPA, accounting, attorneys, architects, generally licensed type folks where there's common ownership. Um, there could be some issues you want to be aware of. The other situation where we have related groups is if family members have businesses together, whether it be spouses, uh, each spouse owns a separate business, but in the IRS's mind, those, those potentially are a, a related group and you have to consider both groups for retirement plan purposes. Um, it's also involved when you've got parents and children who each have businesses, whether they're involved with, with each other or not is a factor, but there are a lot of factors that we have to consider. It's a case by case basis. So if you have that going on, go ahead and, and ask for a little more detail, make sure your service providers are aware of that. You also need to know who are the service providers on your plan and how are they getting paid? So oftentimes you will have a financial advisor or a broker who's helping with the investments. You would have a, a investment company that's actually providing the funds in the plan, such as a Fidelity or a John Hancock or a Schwab. Um, you'll have oftentimes a third party administrator. And if you're a large plan with more than hundred employees, you probably have a separate auditor who's doing the audit of the plan. And then you wanna know how are they getting paid? Are they taking fees out of the plan? Are you paying it at the corporation level by an invoice or there's the revenue sharing going on between the service providers? Um, neither option listed is wrong. It just varies. And I think the key point is you need to know if you're responsible for the plan, who, who's getting paid, how much are they getting paid, and is there revenue sharing? So that's kind of a summary there of the starting points. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan now, and he's going to cover the next section of our presentation. Thank you, Joy. So now that we've, we've started, we have our documents and the basic structure. Now we're beginning operating our plan and figure out who, which of our employees are covered under this plan, who's eligible, who's not eligible. And there are very, there are several nuances that can go into this. So uh, the plan document, again, that, that's gonna dictate almost everything that we do. Um, when I get calls from, from clients or from other uh, uh, CPA uh, partners or financial advisors, a lot of times they'll give me a scenario, and my answer is, well, generally speaking, it, it's this, but your document or the, that plan document is going to override any of that. And so eligibility, just like anything else, is written in that document. In most cases, you're going to see both an age and a service requirement. So for example, um, you might see age 21 or one year of service. So, and the IRS has a statutory maximum eligibility restriction. So the most you can make someone wait to enter a 401k plan is one year. And the longest uh, age, the, the oldest they can, you can restrict them to be is age 21. So again, you can always be uh, more generous and, and let employees in earlier than that but that's as long as you can make someone who is working for you wait to enter into the retirement plan. And generally speaking, one year of service here is not a passage of time. It includes an hours requirement. So for example, a thousand hours in that one year. So some examples, you know, you can have age 18 and six months of employment, no age in three months, 
uh, or just immediately when you're hired, you're eligible to contribute and receive contributions from the employer. The plan document might have different eligibility requirements for employee contributions and employer contributions. That's all okay. You can structure your plan that way, but there may be some consequences of doing that, and you want to make sure that you follow those terms. So generally speaking, if you have, you know, we have one set of requirements for employee contributions, another one for employer match, and a third one for employer profit sharing, that's all okay, but the more differences and um, intricacies that we have in our plan, the more possibilities that we have for making mistakes. So most of the time, we try to mirror the eligibility between employee and employer contributions, have them be the same. Um, again, it just cuts down on the, the possibility that a mistake is made. Eligibility requirement, like, uh, like I have on the screen there, of age 25 and two years of service or three years of service, that is not going to be allowed. You cannot have a waiting period that long in a retirement plan because that's more restrictive than the one year age 21 that the IRS and, and Congress allow. Another thing with eligibility is counting periods of service. So what does the document say? Uh, if I have a six month waiting period, is that a passage of time or is it continuous employment? Um, or what about my part-time employees? So if I have a three month waiting period or a six month waiting period, most documents, again, this is going to be your document specific, but most of the time, that's just a mere passage of time. There's no actual continuous service requirement or hours requirement. So I could work one day a week for the next six months, and if it's just a passage of time, I am eligible to participate in the retirement plan. So again, your document is going to dictate who, how that's calculated, and you need to know that if you're the one responsible for calculating eligibility and determining who's eligible or, or not eligible. Um, if I have rehired employees, when do they join back in? So um, I've had someone with me for five years, they, they left and they were gone for two years and I hired them back. They were eligible beforehand. Most documents are gonna say when you, re, when you have rehired them, they enter in like they never left. Uh, again, your document may say something different, but that's going to be the general rule is rehires are treated just like they never left. So um, I, I had a presentation or attended a seminar once and the presenter basically said, if you rehire someone, you better be sure you really like that person because they don't have to wait anymore to enter the plan. Um, and a lot of times that's where rehired employees is where mistakes are made in plans. Another example is seasonal employees. So I have um, employees hired from March to September, but then they're off from October to February. Well, are they eligible for the plan? Are they not eligible? Well, depends on what your document says, but in most cases, the chances are yes, they're gonna be eligible for the plan. They're gonna re-enter when, when they come back. But again, your document's gonna dictate those, those terms and as you're operating this plan, you just need to be able to be sure that you understand how this is all calculated, what happens with, with these seasonal or part-time employees. And so again, I've, I've just mentioned the seasonal and part-time employees now as a special category group that you need to be aware of. Also, uh, Joy touched on this with leased employees. Our definition in the retirement plan world of a leased employee is different is slightly different from what um, we generally think of. So when we think of a leased employee, we're talking about, I have a contractual arrangement with a leasing organization and they're just providing me with, with individuals to come work for me on specific projects or specific time periods. But at the end of the day, the common law employer is the leasing organization. What we're not talking about with leased employees that, are, that you can exclude are, I've just hired a payroll company to do my W-2s and my um, outsourced um, tax reporting and things like that. But at the end of the day, I'm controlling who's hired, who's fired. They're just doing the reporting and administrative requirements. That is not a leased employee in the, in the terms of a retirement plan. Those are, those are separate from each other. Um, we already touched on this 1099 independent contractors. 
they're not going to be covered by your retirement plan. Uh, this all goes back to the um, debate of who's an employee, who's an independent contractor. The IRS has a whole bunch of guidelines on for determining that. Um, but if, if you do issue 1099, that compensation and that individual is not an employee. And we've had this come up where someone has been a 1099 contractor for years, and then you're switching to an employee. And the question comes to us, well, do they have to wait a one-year waiting period? And the answer is yes, they have not been an employee. Um, the, they've been a 1099 contractor. Um, family members of the owners, they don't get special treatment, um, but there may be limited. So if you have a document that limits what owners can contribute, well, a son or daughter of an owner is, in that, generally speaking, in that same boat. And so you need to be aware they may have some limitations that apply to them as well, even though they don't directly own the company. And then lastly, managers and executives. We get this call uh, every now and then, um, or maybe a nonprofit, you're hiring a new executive director or you're you know, for-profit business and you're trying to attract some key talent um, and you have a one-year or six-month waiting period. We get the question asked, well, can we waive the requirement for this individual? And, and the answer is no. Um, if I have a one-year waiting period, that applies to everybody. I can't say, well, owners and, and my doctors that I'm trying to hire are immediately entered, but my, re my regular staff have to wait one year. We can't do that. That's, that's discriminatory. Um, enrolling employees. So once they are eligible, I, I know, okay, this person's eligible. When do they enroll? What does that process look like? So you need to know after I'm eligible, when do I enter the plan? The plan can say, I enter on the date I meet my eligibility requirements. It might say you enter on the first day of the month, the first day of the quarter, or twice a year, January 1st and July 1st following. You need to know when that eligibility, when the entry date is. For ongoing and existing employees that are already eligible, when can they make modifications to their 401k deferrals? So the document will again specify what, what that is, each pay period, monthly, quarterly, annually. So what happens if I fail to notify my participants that they're eligible? So for example, let's say I'm hired today and we have a six month waiting period and I enter on the first day of the next month. So that would put me in six months, would be in April, and I'd enter on May 1st of next year. But you forget to tell me until January 1st of 2022. So seven months went by and you didn't tell me that I was eligible for this plan. Well, corrective contributions have to be made. Um, the IRS, is very, very helpful in this area and has a lot of guidance on how to make corrections. And generally speaking, the employer is the one that has to put in the money, not the employee. You didn't tell the employee, so the employer, you are responsible for, for making up making up to them, plus earnings. Um, so a best practice here is get document in writing from all of your participants what they want to contribute even if they don't want to sign up, you know they're not going to sign up, that's fine. Get them to sign the form and say they are doing zero. For those of you that are audited by outside CPA firms, you probably get this every single year. Show us your enrollment forms and show this person's election. Um, and if you don't have it, you're probably going to get some kind of writing or comment from the auditor. Um, even small plans have that in writing. On every single IRS or DOL audit that we have had, that's been a question from the, those auditors is give us your paperwork so we can see it. Now the enrollment process, uh, the employees need to receive certain documents. The 401k world is very heavily regulated. So the Congress and the IRS and the Department of Labor, they want to make sure the employees know about the plan and they're given all the information they need to make informed decisions. You and I know they probably aren't reading what everything that they're given, but we have to give that to them. That is the, those are the rules. So basic enrollment documents are things like the summary plan description, the salary deferral form, the investment election form, a beneficiary designation. A best practice here, I stress this all the time, is make sure employees complete who their beneficiaries are. Uh, unlike other assets they may have, if they die, it goes to whoever's on that beneficiary form. And make sure they keep it up to date. So maybe have 
um, annual, just a reminder email to them saying, hey, remember, make sure, check your, your beneficiaries. If you have a life change, you had a new new child, maybe you want to make some changes, or you got divorced or married, uh, make sure those are, those are up to date. In addition, there are investment disclosures that have to be made each year. So we kind of broke this up into three categories of, of notices that have to go to your employees. So that it, their initial enrollment and eligibility, um, summary plan description, salary deferral, and beneficiary designation forms have to go out. Annually, again, depending on what your plan is and, and the structure, safe harbor notices, QDIA notices, which are for default investments, like if you have target date funds that the participant defaults into. Fee disclosures, summary annual reports, that kind of goes, that goes out annually. When someone leaves, they have to receive a distribution paperwork and a special tax notice. And um, your service provider, your TPA, your record keeper, they may have services that can help you automate some of these items. Uh, so check with them uh, to help you so you don't have to be responsible for all of these. Um, there are plenty of providers now offering eligibility calculations. They'll determine eligibility for you and send out the notices automatically. Um, and, and again, that can all take a load off of your plate. You, may, you will have to pay for it, but uh, you may consider that as, as a service offering. Um, we are um, next. The next section here is on payroll and eligible compensation. Um, and before we, and I'm going to turn it over to Joy here. Uh, but before we do that, there's actually a question that came in, and I'll, I'm going to pause and answer the question now. So the question came in said, "Aren't a lot of enrollment and salary deferrals now done electronically?" They, we don't get forms anymore, and the employee can change their election with their record keeper, and then notify me with a message uh, that they went in and, and made their contribution election. Electronic is fine. Electronic is great, um, and, and there's no problem with that. Yes, more and more record keepers are moving to electronic means of enrolling employees. There's no problem with that, but you should still have something from the employee that says, I don't want to contribute, a, zero, a negative election. So whether they, they should be able to do that online. So if they go into the investment company website and do the enrollment process, they elect to do zero. They should, they should be going through that process so you have documentation, one, that they were offered the plan, number two, that you have it in writing that they don't want to contribute. Um, and then same thing with changes. Uh, a notification, a simple email from the from the record keeping company or from the employee is fine. It doesn't need to be a formal agreement. Um, it, you know, those changes are fine, but have it documented and in writing. That is that's the key point we're trying to get across here. Um, whether you're pulling money out of the paycheck, um, just you want to make sure it's documented and that you have proof both ways that you were given the plan and that they were aware of it. So now on to Joy with um, payroll and eligible compensation. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, so this next section uh, comes uh, out of just a myriad of questions we in our group field um, day in and day out from our clients um, about payroll and eligible compensation issues. Um, there are two types of contributions that go into a typical retirement plan. Um, a 401k, a 403b, a 457, a simple, typically will have both employee voluntary payroll deductions, and they will also have employer funded contributions of some type. Um, most of the time now you can make, employees can select pre-tax deferrals, which are the traditional uh, 401k method. A lot of plans these days now offer the Roth option. Um, so if, if you are familiar with the Roth IRA, a Roth 401k is very similar, except there's no income restrictions if you do it inside your 401k plan. So that is becoming quite a popular feature um, to offer both. Um, employer contributions can come in both match, discretionary profit sharing, or a required, what we call a safe harbor contribution. 
So those are generally the types of monies flowing in, and, and most of which are based on some type of compensation determination. Okay, so one of the number one top uh, top areas that both the DOL and the IRS look at when they audit, if, if you happen to be lucky enough to get selected for um, one of those friendly governmental audits, one of the first things they will ask you is to show them your employee deduction schedule and that you deposited the employee's monies each pay period. Um, the regulations say that employee deferrals and loan payments, so money you've taken out of the employee's paychecks on a per pay period basis, must be transferred to the plan as soon as administratively possible after the pay date. Those employee monies must be segregated away from the general assets of the employer. So what does as soon as administratively possible mean? And there is a, a myriad of, of things we see. Uh, we have some employers who say, well, I've only got two people. It's too much of a hassle to put it in every week. I put it in once a month. Um, some do it every pay period, which is correct, but but there's a lot of people who are not following this rule. Um, our advice is always to follow the general guidelines below, which is if you are a large employer with more than 100 participants, you need to be depositing it within three business days after each pay period. If you don't have 100, if you are called what we call a small employer, you should get it in within seven business days so that you are in a, in the IRS's frame of timely deposits. Um, but other things people do sometimes, I had one employer who said, well, I've got four people. They're all on salary. I know what their, you know, I know what their salary is going to be for all year. Um, so I put all the, if they, if they picked, I want 5% of my salary. I just calculate 5% and put it in, in the first quarter and I'm done. You, you know, you, you cannot do that. This is a salary deferral. So you can't make a deferral until you earn the salary. So you should not be pre-funding employee contributions either. It should come out with the pay and should be deposited timely after each pay period. So that's, if you are handling the payroll, that is your number one job is to make sure that the employee contributions are put in each pay period as soon as you can after each pay period. Don't sit on that money. Okay, the other thing you have to pay attention to are the IRS imposes certain maximum contribution dollar amounts and limitations in, in how you calculate benefits. Um, these are part of the, uh, what we call the cost of living adjustment tables. So the COLA, every year they give us a new limit um, so right now, the numbers you're seeing here are the are the limits for 2020 tax years, okay? They will update it each year. So if you have individuals who are trying to max out their contributions and want to put in as much as possible each year, you want to be sure you know what is the new limit for each year when we when we roll over into January, okay? So here are the limits for 2020. The maximum employee deferrals in a 401k are 19.5. Um, if you're over 50, there is a perk for being over 50, believe it or not. And it is you get to make additional contributions um, to your 401k plan. So you get a limit of 26,000 if you're over 50. And another common mistake is, is in not limiting the compensation when you calculate benefits. Um, the IRS basically imposes a artificial compensation cap. And what that means is it doesn't matter if someone earns $300,000, $600,000, we're, we're just going to calculate benefits on 285 and that's a number set by the IRS. So where we see that become a problem is in the example below, let's say we've got an individual whose, whose wages are 325, 
And so the company match says we're going to give a match of 4% of pay. And so this person contributed 19.5, 4% of 3.25 would be 13,000. But that's not correct because that doesn't take into account the IRS limit on the compensation. And so the guy's correct match is 4% of 285,000, um, which is 11.4. So that's where a violation comes in is you've given him more matching contributions than the plan allows. Actually, it's more than the IRS allows because of the that's the IRS limit. Um, we did have a question come in that says, when do we anticipate the new limits to be published each year? Um, that generally, the COLA tables generally come out usually late November or the first week of December, somewhere in that neighborhood. So probably sometime in the next 30 days, we'll get the new 2021 limits. Okay. So be sure you're, for your individuals that have higher compensation, be sure you're not calculating benefits on a higher amount. Um, the next group of folks is going to be self-employed individuals. It, some of these calculations are fairly easy when it's a W-2 because you, just, you know what the W-2 is, you know what the wage is. Self-employed individuals are a little bit harder to deal with in terms of calculating benefits because they're eligible compensation is their net earnings from self-employment. So what we're primarily talking about is if you've got a sole proprietor or an LLC, single member, or partners who get partnership income, their plan compensation is their net earnings from self-employment. So you often have to coordinate with the CPA um, and so the, their compensation is not really known until the tax return is done by the CPA and their self-employment is known, which is generally after the year is over with. Um, so here's what we recommend for individuals who are self-employed. They need to make their salary deferral election in writing before the last day of the year. So they need to say, okay, this year I want to put in 10% of my pay or I want to put in the maximum dollar limit, okay? And then they would fund their personal contributions after the year's over with when their actual self-employment earnings can be determined. Um, the reason this is important is let, let's say someone's self-employment earnings are fluctuate. So one year it might be really good self-employment income and one year it they just are in a business where it's unpredictable and the next year they might have a loss. So if somebody funds their personal contributions, um, let's say they put the max in of their, let's say they're over 50 and they put in $26,000 and then they go to do their tax return and their actual self-employment income is only $20,000. Well, they have deferred more than their income and so they've got a violation there. So for self-employed folks, um, we, we generally like to see them wait until after their self-employment earnings are somewhat known to, to start funding contributions. Okay. Um, the other issue is special compensation that, that really sort of causes havoc when we do retirement plans or irregular pay, non-cash, and severance pay. So irregular pay are things such as performance-based bonuses, commissions and overtime, or even Christmas bonuses. Um, so what do you do with those? Do, are those have 401k? Do they have match? How, how do I handle those? Um, generally, your document will tell you if those items are included or excluded. Um, I will tell you the IRS is not in huge fan of you excluding compensation items. And so they overlay a, an additional set of regulations called a compensation test. If you decide I'm not gonna give them benefits on some of these special pay items. So again, check your document. If it doesn't specifically say bonuses are excluded, then it needs to be covered. Same thing with non-cash compensation, car allowances, or you know, sometimes you have to tax the employees on life insurance that you paid, and that becomes compensation 
but you can't have deferrals on it because it's not there's no way to actually fund deferrals on a non-cash item. Um, and the other thing, severance pay. So, so there's a lot of confusion surrounding severance pay. Um, severance pay is not, uh, uh, let me say what it is not first. Severance pay is not when somebody, let's say somebody leaves on a Friday, that's their last day, and they had a few extra hours and they had some overtime, or I mean, they had some unused PTO, some unused vacation, and we're gonna pay them out two weeks later for their those items. So that's not severance pay. I mean, that's pay they actually um, are, were due because they worked at your company. Severance pay generally is payments you make to somebody for not working. In other words, I'm gonna pay you to go away. I'm not paying you for work you've already done or work you will do. I'm paying you not to not to provide services. And so generally severance pay is not eligible for benefits, okay? But again, you need to kind of seek out your service providers and get assistance on that if you have that type of issue going on. Okay, now we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to see if I can answer them. Um, is okay so the first question is if you have two schedule c's so two businesses and one has a 401k plan and one does not is the net income added together for the contribution amount dan do you want to take that question sure so I think you had um, that question a couple of days ago yeah so uh the answer is going to be, well, it, uh, it's going to depend <laughs> on, on the document. So, so, for example, I've got a Schedule C business with, um, you know, all, all these employees. Uh, the answer is going to be, generally speaking, it's going to be yes, you're going to, because the other one's probably a participating employer um, in, in the plan. But, again, it, it it's going to depend there um, whether or not you're going to combine those two together. Okay, thank you. The second question is it says that there's a payroll provider that bases the employee contributions on gross salary less the employee portion of benefit costs, such as medical, dental, vision. Is that correct? Um, you know, why, why would we reduce the employee contributions by the benefits? I mean, again, I would say we need to look at that plan's definition of compensation. But in general, compensation is, is net is gross comp before any deductions are applied. So anytime you're reducing total compensation, you've got to run a special test on it to make sure that it's not discriminating against the non-highly compensated employees. So you'd want to look at that carefully, but but there would be some issues there. I, I general, it should be gross pay, not net of benefits. Right. Now, okay. now on that, your document, your document might exclude for compensation purposes, deferrals made to a 401k or 125 plan for purposes of contributions. And again, that, that is, a document option I don't believe we we don't see that very often so um, definitely check with that though check on that because there could be negative ramifications of having it, that definition of compensation okay so we're going to go to our one of our next segment on participant transactions and then finish out with a few other uh, COVID related things, but Dan, you want to talk about transactions? Sure. So now we've we've enrolled our employees, we we're they're contributing while they're working for us, and now they have either left us or they want money out of the plan. Um, and so there are certain distributable events that are defined by the IRS. Every plan is going to have these stipulations for allowing employees to get money. So they, they leave us, they terminate employment, whether of their own free will or we've gotten, we fired them. Uh, they've died or become disabled and can no longer work for us. 
um, we, we as a plan sponsor of the plan decide to close the retirement plan and terminate the plan or an employee has reached age 72. Every document is going to have stipulations for paying out benefits under these circumstances. As a plan sponsor, as someone who's, who is giving this plan to my employees, I do have some extra options to be a little bit more flexible and allow my employees access to their funds earlier than they would otherwise be able. So you can have in-service withdrawals. Generally speaking, we see age 59 and a half as the cutoff there. The reason is if you take money out of the plan before 59 and a half, it's subject to a 10% early withdrawal penalty. At 59 and a half and older, there's no 10% withdrawal penalty, just the tax. So a lot of our plans have in-service provisions. Um, hardship withdrawals. If I have some kind of financial hardship and I need money, I can have access to it. You can allow participants to borrow against their account balance. Um, I uh, we'll talk about that here in, in a minute. Um, but all these options are, uh, they, they are options. They can be added or removed if, if I want to. And then the last one for 2020 is COVID-19 CARES Act that was passed to be in the March, allowed for um, those individuals that have been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic to take withdrawals if they are a qualified individual. We'll talk about that, that at the end, which is just what you want to hear more of, is, is CARES Act and coronavirus and everything that's, that's going on there. So let's go through just a couple of these types of transactions, um, some of the more, you know, not just regular distributions, but some of the more complex ones, if you will. The first one is, is participant loans. So again, this is optional. You don't have to allow your participants to borrow against their account balance. But if you do, you're, you're, you will have a specific participant loan program that will dictate the terms of the allowing your participants to borrow against their account. In order for it to be a non-taxable distribution to the participant, they cannot borrow more than 50% of their vested account balance or $50,000, whichever is less. Um, they have to be make the repayments by payroll deduction. And as long as they repay it within five years, it's not taxable. Um, so let me go into detail on a couple of these things. First one there, repayment by payroll deduction. Um, occasionally we'll get a question from a plan sponsor that says, so-and-so took a loan from the plan and now they're coming to us and they say they don't want us, they don't want to have it be repayment coming out of their paycheck. And my answer is they, they say, okay, can we, not have them repay it and my answer to them is no um, you need to withhold those when the participant took their distribution they signed a promissory note which is a promise to pay and in there it certainly said something along the lines of i understand that and authorized withholdings from my paycheck um if you don't follow i mean if, if you as the plan sponsor don't have those withholdings come out of their paycheck you kind of put your plan at risk for not being in compliance. So, um, no, it's not. A, once a, that's, when a participant takes a loan, they do it with the understanding that they have to repay it. Um, the loan term, five years, there may be some special circumstances where it can be longer, things like military service. The Coronavirus uh, CARES Act allows it to run a little bit longer. Um, if I'm doing a purchase of a home, I can extend that to 15 years. I've seen 30. I wouldn't recommend going that far, but there may be cases uh, where I extend it past that. Generally speaking with loans, we typically recommend a, a limit on the number outstanding to an individual participant to one or two at a time. And, um, you know, if you do want to allow loans, one benefit of them is that studies have shown that plans with loan provisions tend to have higher deferral rates. Um, the next type of withdrawal is, is hardship withdrawal. So if I have a financial hardship, the IRS has a list of seven approved reasons that they call a hardship. Again, there are a lot of things in this life that are that are hardships, but these are the seven that the IRS has said, these are hardships that qualify for you for withdrawing funds out of your 401k plan. 
things like down payment on your home, payment of college tuition, uninsured medical bills. Um, the new one that they came up with as part of uh, just recently in the past two years is if you live or work in a FEMA declared disaster area um, because they've been having so many natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, fires that they would allow withdrawals for that Congress would have to go in and do something each time. They finally just said a blanket. If it's declared by FEMA as a disaster area, it qualifies. Um, one thing I'll say on hardship withdrawals. The participant can self-certify that they have a need um, and that they have no other source of funds to pay this hardship. So that means you do not need to go analyze bank accounts or get credit reports and see if they can borrow the money. You don't need to do that. They can self-certify that. However, the participant cannot self-certify the hardship itself. So you can give them a form that says and say they can check they can check a box that yes I have uninsured medical bills that I need to pay. However, you need to be getting some form of documentation you or someone that you've hired to do that for you as you're uh, in that role, uh, whether that's copies of the medical bills or there is a kind of a shorter form where the participant indicates you know things like for medical bills for example date of service the provider, the amount due, if they don't want to turn the medical bill itself. But they cannot just check a box on a form that says, I have uninsured medical bills, give me money. Okay? So I want to make sure that's clear there. And then the last area is uh, that we'll talk about here is required minimum distributions. So at age 72, participants have to start taking money out. If I'm working for my 401k provider and I'm for my, for my company that gives me my 401k and um, I'm not an owner, I can defer my RMD until I finally retire. Um, with RMDs and required minimum distributions, these, this is a plan qualification issue. That means the plan itself has to issue these, these required minimum distributions. They cannot combine it with RMDs or take it out of their own IRA. The plan has to issue this, and this is a plan um, administrator requirement. 5% owners um, have to take them, they cannot defer them until they retire. So if I'm a 5% owner at, in the year I turn 72, I have to start taking it whether or not I continue working or not. One note is that the CARES Act for 2020 waives the 2020 required minimum distribution requirement. So you won't be required to take money out this year due to the CARES Act. Um, finally, a couple other items here. Um, the uh, 5500, if you're a 401k plan, you're going to be filing a tax re tax return. It's an information return only, and um, you have to file that each year. The due date is seven, the, the last day of the seventh month after plan year end, unless you extend it. So for calendar year plans, that's July 31st with an extension to October 15th. Every plan that's in a, covered by ERISA, E-R-I-S-A, has to have a fidelity or an ERISA bond covering 10, at least 10% of the plan assets. This protects the plan in case of theft. So the, the classic example is my bookkeeper, we, we had salary deferrals coming out of employee, and instead of that bookkeeper remitting those salary deferrals to the record keeper of the investment company, they just send them to their own bank account. So that, that insurance policy would step in and reimburse the plan in that situation. And then lastly, if you are a large plan, over 100 eligible participants, then you can, you, you not can, you are required to have an independent CPA audit each year. Um, that has to be filed with the 5500 itself. Uh, so those are just some kind of miscellaneous items uh, covering the plan or miscellaneous topics there. And the last section Joy will cover is the, the CARES Act and COVID-19 distribution. Okay, and I'm going to pick up two questions that came in on the on the participant transactions there. Um, someone asked if, if you have seasonal employees, can you have loans where the seasonal employees' repayments are only taken when they're working? 
Um, that becomes quite difficult because generally the regulations say loan payments have to be made through right with regular um, payments, regular scheduled payments. And so I think it's going to depend on how long they're off work and what your uh, participant loan program says. So, you know, you may need to follow up on that. Um, seasonal employees kind of cause havoc with loan programs. Uh, is there an upper limit on the bond amount? Yes, uh, you do not have to have a bond for more than $500,000. Um, so if your plan has $5 million, you should you should set $500,000 as your bond and you should be in good shape there. Um, so in terms of, we, we just have a little bit more time here. Um, so COVID distribution. So the CARES Act provided just for 2020, um, some special withdrawal options. Um, the thing is, each employer had the option to use these provisions or not. It was not a mandatory um, regulation that a company had to, had to use these special options. They could elect it. And so one of the things, um, if your employer elected it, was they they could allow affected employees to take up to $100,000 out in 2020. Um, the loan program could be expanded to say, instead of the cap being $50,000, it's $100,000. However, the, that only applied to loans that were taken out um, up to September 30th. So no longer can someone borrow up to $100,000. They had to have done that by September 30th. To, to take advantage of that. And then it also allowed for certain loan payments to be deferred um, by 12 months if they were affected by COVID in 2020. Um, and so there's not a lot of guidance out there about how you actually do all of this or how you document it. So we're all kind of on a on a shoestring effort here to, to, do, to do this as best we can and, and make sense of it. So there's a lot of variables to think about. Um, and, and in terms of qualified individuals, if you've been diagnosed, your spouse has been diagnosed, you're gonna be a qualified individual. Um, and then the broad nature of it says if you've experienced adverse financial consequences due to furlough, layoff, reduced hours, reduced compensation, or the inability to work due to lack of childcare or a business closure or any other reason provided for by the IRS, you're gonna be a qualified individual. So that's pretty broad. Um, and, and the good news is for those of us who are working with these type of provisions, it's a self-certification statement. So no one has to, you know, from a HIPAA perspective, you don't have to tell me anything. Um, about your medical situation, you simply sign a form that says, I am a qualified individual and I can take your word for it. Um, your employer can take your word for it. In other words, you don't have to produce your COVID test. You don't have to, you don't have to tell us anything. You just have to say, I am qualified. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts to, to the COVID distribution issues. Um, and that essentially wraps up here our um, presentation. We do have plenty of upcoming webinars at, within our firm, and so we would encourage you to go to cricpa.com slash events to see the next round of um, seminars that we're presenting and take advantage of those. Again, Daniel and I, thank you so much for um, your time. If you have any questions, here's our contact information. Feel free to call us, reach out to us by email. Um, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to help you. And we just appreciate so much you taking time out of your day today. Hope you guys have a great day.